Okay, welcome everyone to Daf Yomi, one week at a time, Masechet Nazir. Uh, we are uh, on our fourth lesson, our fourth shiur uh, of this Masechet, and today we are going to be reviewing Daf 23 through 29. Um, and we are starting at the Mishnah at the top of Daf 23. So the Mishnah tells us that um, this, the case is that a woman became a Nazira, right? She took upon herself to be a Nazir, and then she became impure, and she drank wine, um, and presumably this was on purpose. Uh, so she gets lashes as a punishment for um, not keeping to the laws of a, a Nazir. The Mishnah continues, if her husband revoked the vow, but she didn't know about it, and again, she drinks wine and she becomes impure, she does not get lashes, right? Even though she thinks she's violating something, the fact that she's really not violating something means that she does not get punished. Um, Rabbi Yehuda says she actually does get uh, what's called rebellious lashes, meaning these are lashes that are dira banan, uh, rabbinic in origin, uh, and it's for someone who is rebelling against the Jewish law um, for whatever reason. So in this case, right, she's rebelling even though she really didn't transgress in this in this scenario. Um, the Gemara explains um, that we said that she doesn't get lashes. The first opinion was she doesn't get lashes, but there's a brighta that says she does need to ask for atonement and forgiveness, right? Because she wanted to violate her vow, even though technically she did not, right? And this is based on a verse uh, that says, right, the person didn't know yet is guilty, right? So what does that mean, right? You didn't know that really you weren't transgressing and you were trying to transgress. And here the Gemara gives different uh, scenarios where um, when someone, let's say, wants to transgress but doesn't, right, wants to eat a non-kosher burger and it turns out that really it's kosher, uh, or vice versa, right? You wanted to eat something kosher, but made a mistake. Uh, and the Gemara talks about all these um, incidences where uh, if you were trying to transgress, um, you still have some sort of culpability, even though, again, as I mentioned, you haven't uh, technically transgressed anything. Uh, from here, uh, the Gemara talks about tzaddikim, righteous people, versus transgressors. Uh, so what is a righteous person? It's a person, uh, right? And here the Gemara is trying to say that you can do one small thing and change it from being a righteous person to someone who transgresses, uh, right? So a righteous person is a person who eats the Korban Pesach and does it as a mitzvah, right? Because they want to fulfill the mitzvah. And, and a transgressor is someone who eats the Korban Pesach out of gluttony, right? Uh, you ate a big meal and then you keep eating and you keep eating. And the Gemara says, wait a minute, really? That's a poshea? That's a transgressor? No, that's already like, you didn't do anything really wrong. Um, so the Gemara says, no. Uh, tzaddik, a righteous person, is someone who has relations with their wife. And a transgressor, a poshea, is someone who has relations with their sister by accident. And the Gemara says, what? And they said, no, maybe we're talking about Lot, right? The story of Lot, uh, if you remember, um, the, um, Lot uh, lives in Sdom. He's saved with his two daughters. They think, the daughters think that the entire world was destroyed. So they get their father drunk and they sleep with their father. They each get pregnant, and from them come, right, Ammon and Moab, right? Those are the two children. So the Gemara explains, right, who are righteous people? Lot's daughters had intention to do a mitzvah by sleeping with their father. So the daughters are righteous, and Lot, right, had the wrong intentions. Therefore, he's seen as a transgressor, a poshea. <coughs> 
Um, and then the Gemara says, wait a minute, but it wasn't his fault. He was drunk. He didn't know what he was doing. So the Gemara says, right, for the first daughter, he was drunk. But after he realized what happened with the first daughter, he shouldn't have had anything to drink on the second night. Uh, and therefore, he was at fault. Um, and from here, the Gemara goes into uh, the verses that talk about Lot and Avraham separating, right? To, they were together for a long time, and then they separate. Um, so the Gemara says that when Lot separated from Avraham, that led to contention between the two of them, right? And therefore, um, Lot's descendants and Avraham's descendants, right, in the future, were going to be rivals or enemies, right? And therefore, right, Lot separated from Avraham. Therefore, uh, later on in the Torah, God tells us that people from Ammon and Moab, these are the descendants of Lot, um, they cannot convert to Judaism because th this these two nations were so unfriendly, I mean, even worse, right? They were so terrible to the Jewish people when they were in the desert uh, that the, the Torah tells us that they cannot convert. Um, of course, it's interesting to, under, to understand, and we have learned this before, that uh, we learned that it's really the males are not allowed to convert, but the women are, right? Don't forget, uh, Ruth is from Ammon, um, right? And, uh, uh, sorry, is from Moab, uh, and um, Shlomo's wife was from Amon, right? And these are uh, people who do end up actually converting and joining to Judaism and coming into Judaism, but it takes much later. Um, and since we're talking about people who, right, we, were, we started the conversation by saying people who do the right thing for the wrong reason, uh, but now we're going to talk about people who do the wrong thing for the right reason, right? So Lot's daughters, right? They sleep with their father, even though you're not supposed to sleep with your father, um, but they did because they felt that that was uh, the only way to perpetuate mankind. Um, the same thing with Tamar. Um, Tamar, um, who was, right, Yehuda's daughter-in-law, and she ends up sleeping with Yehuda because he does not give her... Um, the next son, uh, right? So Tamar sleeps with her, her um, father-in-law and um, kings and prophets descend from her, whereas Zimri, Zimri does, um, you know, forbidden relations um, and from Zimri come 24,000 people who die. Uh, so we see that one can do similar actions and they have very different consequences. Um, right, so from here, the Gemara talks about the idea that great, right, the Gemara says, greater is a sin for the sake of heaven, right, lishma, we say in Hebrew, uh, than a mitzvah that is not for the sake of heaven. And the Gemara says, really? It's better to do a sin for the sake of heaven than a mitzvah that's not? That doesn't make sense, right? A person should also always do mitzvot. Right, and here we have a very famous line. In Hebrew, the line is, mitoch lo lishma, ba lishma. And that means that um, it's always better to do a mitzvah, right, a commandment, even if you don't have the proper intentions, right, because even if you do it without the proper intentions, eventually, if you keep doing it, you will have the proper intentions. So we see that, it's always good to do a mitzvah. It doesn't matter what your intent is. So the Gemara says, you're right, you're right. Rather say it's on the same level, which is also very interesting to think that doing a mitzvah for the wrong reasons would be on the same level as doing a transgression for the right reasons. So that's just, I think, a very interesting concept, uh, which you can think about. Uh, the Gemara now brings some examples, right? If you remember... From uh, Sefer Shoftim, from the book of Judges, Yael sleeps with Sisra in order to kill him, right? And here they talk about uh, the fact that she has relations with him maybe numerous times. Don't worry, she didn't have any pleasure from it because she was doing it in order to kill him, right? She was doing it for the right reasons. Um, Balak, 
if you remember the story of Balak and Bilam, um, Balak brings sacrifices, even though they're not for the right reasons. Um, the Gemara says that he therefore merited to have a root come from him, right? Um, root comes from Eglon, who comes from Barak, uh, from Balak, uh, and therefore uh, we see that even when you do a mitzvah, something positive, even for the wrong reasons, right? Balak wants to curse the Jewish people, um, but he um, brings sacrifices to God, uh, and therefore he is rewarded. Um, the Gemara continues that God rewards proper speech, right? Um, the daughter of Lot uh, calls her son Moab, right? Me'av, from my father, uh, as opposed to Amon, which is Ben Ami, right? So um, Ben Ami is a nicer way of saying, right? He, this child came from my father as opposed to being very clear, uh, and therefore... Um, we are not allowed to torment the people from Ammon as opposed to Moab, right? They are rewarded for that uh, proper speech. Um, from here, the Gemara tells us you should always try to be the first person to do a mitzvah, right? Again, we see from the older daughter of Lot, she gets up and she sleeps with her father first. Again, interesting, uh, we see it as a positive thing. Okay, Daf 24, the Mishnah tells us, um, if a husband revokes the wife's nizirut, right? The wife decided she wanted to be a nizira. The husband revokes the vow. However, the wife already separated out the animals for her sacrifices. If you remember, at the end of the nizirut process, um, a person brings three sacrifices, a chatat, a sin offering, an ola, a burnt offering, and a shlamim, I don't know how to say shlamim, um, another offering where it's half eaten. Um, so um, those three uh, sacrifices are brought. So let's say she already separated out the animals. If, right, so now, oh, peace offering? Okay, I like that. I'm not sure. I, oh, you're saying from shalom. Okay, Lynn says peace offering. It could be. Um, so we have these three sacrifices. So let's say the woman set aside these animals. Now, when you set aside animals, um, they have sanctity to them. So the Gemara asks, right, if these animals were really the husband's animals, so they can go back to the flock because he's the one that revoked the, the vow. It's his animals. That's it. They go back to... Um, uh, they go back to the flock. They're not sanctified. If it was her own animals, so then the sin offering has to die um, because, again, we've seen this numerous times, when a sin offering cannot be brought, uh, it can't be brought voluntarily, right? Because this is designated for a specific sin, and therefore it needs to, um, it needs to die, unfortunately. Um, and the Ola and the Shlamim, the other two sacrifices, are sacrificed because those offerings are allowed to be brought voluntarily. So even though she doesn't have to bring them, she can bring them voluntarily, uh, and that is what's done. Um, I actually had a student who emailed me about the, uh, I don't want to say cruelty, but the, the discomfort about this idea that the the chatat, the sin offering, has to die. Uh, and we had a discussion about the fact that this is why um, the sages said, even though it's, you know, the, the cases come up in the Gemara all the time, but the sages actually said no one should sanctify their animals till they get to the Beit HaMikdash, right, till they get to the temple. Once you get to the temple, you sanctify your animals, you bring your sacrifice, but don't sanctify it beforehand uh, because then you get into all this trouble. So I think that was the way to get around all these things, but if you don't listen, these are the consequences. Okay, let's say that was the case if she set aside animals. What happens if she set aside money? Now, we're going to have two cases when you set aside money. A person can say, here is, right, a hundred dollars, uh, whatever, a hundred shekel for my sacrifices. 
or they can say, here is, right, $20 for my chatat, $20 for my ola, $20 for my shlamim. So if you specify the money for each sacrifice, that's going to be different than unspecified money, right? Unspecified money means here is, right, $100 for my sacrifices. So that's going to be important for the rest of our conversation. So the, the Mishnah explains um, on DAF 24, if she set aside unspecified money, she should take the money and buy voluntary voluntary sacrifices. Again, a burnt offering or a peace offering, those are all options to be brought. If she set aside specified money, right, for each sacrifice, so then the sin offering money gets thrown into the Dead Sea, into Yama Melach. I'm not sure if we've discussed this before, maybe in uh, Masachat Psachim. Um, when we say that you can't have any benefit from money, the Gemara says, or the Mishnah, it gets thrown into Yam HaMelech. Uh, I always thought like it would be very interesting to kind of dredge uh, the Dead Sea and see if you can really find some old money in there if they keep telling them to throw it into the sea. Um, and those of you who are in Israel or are visiting Israel sometime soon, the Israel Museum has a beautiful exhibit of an artist that dunked uh, different objects into the Dead Sea, and it's all like sculptures of salt. It's very interesting, so it made me think of this. Um, okay, uh, sin offering money goes to Yama Melach. You're not allowed to get any benefit from it. Um, and money for the Ola, you can buy an Ola. Again, the burnt offering can be voluntary. The same thing for the Shlamim, you can buy a Shlamim. Okay, the Gemara explains, right, if the husband is obligated to provide his wife with animals for a sacrifice, then why do the animals go back to the flock? Meaning, if he needs to give her the animals, that means she had the right to sanctify them. So our Mishnah seems to be according to the, the sage who says he isn't obligated to give her the money, the animals. Therefore, when she took them, she took them maybe without permission. Therefore, the animals go back to the flock. And the Gemara says, no, wait a minute. We learned that the husband writes in the Ketuva that he will provide the animals for any sacrifices that she needs to bring. So the Gemara says, you're right, but in the end, she doesn't need to bring the sacrifice, so the animals go back. Um, okay, we said if she bought with her own money, so then um, um, how does this work? The Gemara explains that she has her own money, like let's say she saved it from what he gave her, or somebody gave her money and said, this is only for you. Uh, so the Gemara explains how she can have her own money, and we've seen that before. Um, there are four cases where the um, shlamim, the, the peace offering in, uh, of the nazir, doesn't come with bread. I didn't mention this before, but uh, when a nazir brings the shlamim offering, it also comes with accompanied bread. If the person is not a nazir anymore, you can bring the sacrifice, but not with bread. So what are the cases? Right, our case of the wife whose husband revoked the vow. Another case is a father, and we'll see this later on today, that a father can make his minor son, right, under 13, a nazir, um, but the, right, and the father has responsibility to provide for all the sacrifices, and if the son or the relatives protest against being a nazir, so then the son isn't a nazir, but the father still might need to bring some of the sacrifices. The third case is if someone separated the sacrifices and then died, so then the chatat, the sin offering, you can't bring, but the shlamim, you can bring, but that again is without bread. Okay. Um, and the fourth case is if you lost your sacrifice, the animal, and then you brought another one instead, and then you found it, 
so you can bring it again as a voluntary offering. Uh, and again, this is without bread. Okay, um, Daf 25. Um, if you separated unspecified money, right? Again, we said, <clears throat> this is for my sacrifice fund, right? A hundred shekel, a hundred dollars. Um, you can, as we said, you can buy voluntary sacrifices with it, even though it consists of money that was meant for the chatat, even though for the sin offering, even though it's not specified, a third of the money was meant for a sin offering, how could it be that you can use that money for a voluntary offering? So the Gemara explains, this is a special case. Uh, and the way we explain it, in Hebrew we say, it's a halacha lemoshe misinai. This is a special law that was taught to Moshe on Har Sinai, meaning there's no verse to explain it. Um, and there's no, I don't want to say there's no logical explanation. One can construct one, but not a very foolproof one. And therefore we say, this is our tradition. Our tradition is that you can do this, um, even though um, it shouldn't be the case, because as I mentioned, money from a chatat should not be used for anything else. Um, okay, right, allocated money for a chatat, right, if you set it aside, cannot be used for a sacrifice, right, and that we said, uh, and we said that before. Um, okay, um, daf uh, 26, um, if a person separated money for a pair of birds, right? If you remember, we discussed that a zav or a zava, right? Someone who had uh, unnatural emission or a mitzora, a leper, um, they need to bring two birds as a sacrifice at the end of their process. Now, if you separate, now, one of them is actually a sin offering, and the other is a burnt offering, an ola and a chatat. So the Gemara says that if you separated money for a pair of birds, you can buy an animal um, for that sacrifice. Uh, meaning there are, if, if we're talking about a sacrifice with a sliding scale, right? If you didn't have enough money, you can buy birds, which are cheaper. If you have more money, you can buy animals, right? Animals being um, um, domesticated animals, right? A sheep or a goat. So if it was um, here, you can use that money for animals. If the person died and the money was unspecified, so again, you can use the money for voluntary sacrifices, just like we said for Nazir. Um, okay, so the the Gemara continues. Um, ah, so now let's try to understand, right? Designated money or specified money is when you say, this money is for my chatat, my ola. Right, you you said very specific, um, right? If someone says this money is for my chatat for the sin offering, and the rest is for the rest of the sacrifices, and then he died, so then the money for the sin offering goes to Yama Melach, and the rest of the money is split between the other two sacrifices, and you buy those animals. Let's say you say this money is for my ola, the burnt offering and the rest is for everything else. And then he died, right? The ola money, uh, the burnt offering money is used for the burnt offering, and the rest goes to nedava, to again, a voluntary, um, a voluntary sacrifice, right? And now the Gemara explains, all of this is when we're talking about money. But if you separated an animal, so then uh, that's seen as if it's, right, specified money, because the animal is very specific, and therefore the sin offering uh, would have to die, and the other ones you could bring. Um, okay, uh, DAF 27, ah, so at the bottom of DAF 26, there's a discussion, what, when we use the word money, what do we mean, right, is it only currency, 
right? Dollars, shekel, or is it anything of value? Um, and the Gemara seems to say um, maybe it means anything that is what we would call liquid assets, right? Something that you can use right away uh, or that's not very difficult, right? That's, that has value, but you can use it. You can convert it into money very easily. But something that is not easily converted to money um, is not considered ma'ot, money, and is uh, not included in this discussion. Um, so again, right, let's say you had uh, three, let's say you had three animals for sacrifices, but you didn't specify which animal is for which. The Gemara says, this is on Daf 27, the Gemara says, wait a minute, each one of these sacrifices is a different animal, a different type of animal. Therefore, we just see which one fits into which, right? So the um, female at, right, uh, um, goat or sheep is the sin offering. The, um, the male is going to be the ola, the, the burnt offering, and the ram, meaning the older male, uh, is going to be the shlamim. So we see that even if you didn't designate it, the fact that you set aside these specific animals means you had something in mind. Um, from here, the Gemara talks about, we mentioned the bird offering. Um, so the birds are not designated for a sacrifice till the owner specifically designates them or when the Kohen designates them. Because <coughs> <coughs> um, with birds, it's very challenging right? They can, they look very similar. They can fly around. They can uh, switch places and they very easily can get confused. Uh, and therefore you have to be very careful uh, not to designate them till the last uh, minute. What happens if you have an animal that has a blemish, right? How do we view that animal? Now, an animal with a blemish cannot be a sacrifice. It can be sold and you can use the money to buy the sacrifice. Um, but do we see that money as specified or unspecified? So the Gemara explains when a father, let's say a father was a Nazir and he separated money for the sacrifices and then he died. So the son decides to take on being a Nazir with the specific intention of using the money that the father separated. So the Gemara explains this works. He can do this. We're going to see this Mishnah in a minute um, or in a few minutes. Um, but if he and the father were Nizirim at the same time, meaning they decided to do it together and the father separated money and then he died, the son cannot use that money because Again, the son has his own obligations. He can't use the father's money for that. So that money has to go to, again, nedava, to voluntary sacrifices. Now that was with when we're talking about money. Let's say the father separated animals. So again, as we said, the chatat, the sin offering, dies. The shlamim and the ola can be sacrificed. And here the Gemara asks, wait a minute. What happens if these animals have a blemish? What do we do with them? So Gemara says, no, no, no. We're only talking about animals that are unblemished, that can be used as sacrifices. But if they have a blemish, so you sell the animals and you use the money to buy a voluntary sacrifice, right? So this shows that an animal with a blemish is like cash, right? It's like money and you can use it to buy another sacrifice. Um, okay, um, let's continue. Uh, hold on one second. Um, okay, so the Gemara explains that um, just like the son can use the money that the father separated for his, right, so maybe, right, we said maybe the, the son can use the father's money uh, for his own sacrifice. The Gemara says, no, no. That's only in the case of a Nazir. Uh, however, in the case of uh, somebody else who, uh, let's say the uh, leader of the community, the Nasi, um, 
he can use only use his own sacrifice and not his father's, meaning these things are not transferable. The only transferable um, sacrifice would be one of a nazir. Okay, Dov 28, um, an animal, um, ah, so an animal set aside for a sin offering can only be used for that sin offering, meaning if a person um, transgressed in a very specific thing, and then they, they transgressed again, but if they separated an animal for this sin, that animal can only be used for that sin. However, right, money that's set aside um, can be used um, for, for different things. Well, let's, let's see, right? The question is, right, it can't be used for a more stringent uh, or a more lenient sin. Uh, so then the question is, what do we do with that money? Again, it needs to be used for that specific uh, transgression. Um, and as we said before, right, when the Brita used the word animal, it meant an unblemished animal. But if it had a blemish, that is like um, unspecified money. Uh, the Gemara says, uh, right, again, the unblemished animal has inherent value, can be sold easily, and therefore it's just like money. Okay. <coughs> Our next Mishnah, okay, um, our next Mishnah. So it's important to understand uh, that uh, an animal that is being sacrificed uh, is uh, slaughtered at, in the temple, the blood is collected, and the blood is sprinkled on the altar. Once the blood is sprinkled on the altar, on the Mizbeach, it's considered having been offered. That's the end of the process. Even though other things happen afterwards, that's the end of the process. Um, and as I mentioned before, we know that there are three offerings that are brought for a Nazir. So now the Mishnah tells us, if blood of one of the sacrifices um, was sprinkled on the Mizbeach, on the altar, the husband cannot revoke the vow of his wife anymore, meaning it's as if she already finished her nizirut process. Rabbi Akiva says even if it was just slaughtered, meaning a step beforehand, once the animal is slaughtered, that's it. He cannot revoke it anymore. Um, and this shows, right, that again, um, this sacrifice is the end of the nizirut uh, process. Um, <coughs> Rabbi Meir says, even if the blood was sprinkled, he can still revoke the vow till she shaves her head, right? Because he can say, I don't want to have a wife who's going to be ugly and who shaves her head, even though you should just know my husband always says, even if I ever shaved my head, I would still be pretty. So, right? So he says, uh, he, right here, uh, Rabbi Meir says, the husband can always say, I don't want to have an ugly wife. I don't want her to shave her head. Uh, stop, stop. You can't be a Nazir. Even though it's interesting because it would mean that he didn't know about it for 30 days. I guess she kept it a secret. I don't know. It's interesting. Okay. So the Gemara explains on Daf 28. Um, right. Again, and we'll see this later on in the Masachet. The question is, what signifies the end of the Nazirut? Is it the bringing of the sacrifices or the shaving of one's head. Uh, and that we see from the different opinions in the Mishnah that we just read, right? Rabbi Akiva holds, why does he say even from when you slaughtered the animal? Because we don't want to waste a sanctified animal. Once it was slaughtered, that's it. We want to continue in that process. You cannot revoke it. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, ah, the Gemara says, wait, wait a minute. We said that the husband can say, I don't want my wife to shave her head and be ugly. The Gemara says, wait a minute, she can always wear a wig. So that's not a problem. So the, right, it's interesting that this is already in the time of the Gemara. So the Gemara says, no, right, someone wearing a wig might also be ugly. Um, again, nothing personal to anybody who wears wigs here. Um, but uh, again, 
Uh, the Gemara suggests it as something beautiful. Interestingly, the Gemara says, well, not everybody would think that it's beautiful. Definitely in the time of the Gemara, I imagine wigs were not very beautiful. Um, but nowadays they really are. Okay, next Mishnah. <coughs> and we mentioned this earlier. A man can make his son a Nazir um, if he's a minor, uh, but a mother cannot make her son a Nazir. Um, now, part of the process is the, hus- the father can make his son a Nazir. However, the son or the relatives can reject this idea, right? They can say, no, 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 we don't think this is the right thing to do, right? If he or the relatives shave his head, right, or, right, shaving the head before he finishes the Nazir process, meaning it's a sign of saying, we don't want this, um, or they verbally reject it, so then, and let's say the father already set aside animals for the end of the process, again, the same idea, the chatat, the sin offering, dies, the olan shlamim are, spe- are sink, uh, sacrificed. The same concept, if he had unspecified money, it goes to voluntary sacrifices. If he set aside specific money, the money for the sin offering goes to Yama Melach. The money for the other two sacrifices we use to buy the other two sacrifices. Okay, that's the Mishnah. So the Gemara explains, um, right, we said only the father but not the mother. Why is that? So we have two, uh, two opinions. One is, again, like we said before, halacha lemoshe misinai, meaning this is the tradition. The tradition is, it's a special rule, the father, but not the mother. Or um, the other opinion is that this is seen as an educational tool, uh, right? And the Gemara explains why would you, why would a, a father make his son a nazir? because it teaches the son self-control, right? Just because you want to drink wine, just because you want to play in cemeteries, doesn't mean you should. And therefore, for 30 days, you are going to be limited, right? And the Gemara explains, this is a way to, t- to educate a child on how to um, learn restraint in their lives, but also when it comes to mitzvot, when it comes to Jewish law, right? We know... Uh, that many laws that we keep deal with self-restraint, right? I can't eat anything that I want whenever I want, right? I can't, uh, you know, uh, be on my phone whenever I want, if it's Shabbat, right? So many mitzvot um, kind of um, challenge us to work on self-control. So the Gemara seems to say that a father can use this as a tool, an educational tool. And then why father but not mother? Because the father is commanded to teach his son mitzvot, but not the mother, (coughs) right? And uh, this we'll see in Masecha Kiddushin that talks about uh, how parents educate their children. And of course, nowadays we know that a mother and a father are both equally involved in educating their children. and the truth is, uh, even the Tanakh talks about, uh, right, Musar Avicha the Torah Imecha, right, the ethics of your father and the, the Torah from your mother. So uh, there are definitely different opinions on this. But here we're talking about an obligation, right? The father is obligated, right? He has a mitzvah to educate his son, whereas not the mother, even though the mother's probably doing most of the work anyway, but okay. Um, And we're talking about the son and not the daughter, right? So the father can make the son a Nazir. The father cannot make his daughter a Nazira. uh, And again, the mother cannot do either of them. Um, And again, um, the, the Gemara goes back and forth here. Again, we said there are two different reasons. One is as my mother says, kacha, right, because, right, it's a tradition, this is just the way it is, uh, as opposed to an educational tool. Um, So the Gemara goes back and forth, really, right, how can the relatives have the power to reject it if it's an educational tool, right, meaning 
grandparents or uncles shouldn't necessarily have a a say in how a parent parents the child. And the Gemara actually says, no, that's not true. If the relatives feel that this is inappropriate for this child, they actually can uh, reject it. So it, it, again, it works either way, either because they get special dispensation, that's just the tradition, or in an educational model, uh, the greater, the wider extended family might have the ability to um, have a say in uh, the, the way, the education of the children, which is just a very interesting uh, understanding. The Gemara says, wait a minute, if it's just an educational tool, how could the child bring a, a sacrifice? We know that you're not allowed to just bring sacrifices to the uh, temple just because you feel like it. Of course, you could bring voluntary sacrifices, but not a sin offering. Uh, so the Gemara says, maybe this is according to the person who says, um, that actually you can voluntarily bring these sacrifices. Um, and uh, from here, the Gemara says, when can a father, we said that a father can make the son an azir uh, till the son is an adult. What's an adult? So there's two ways to understand this. One is till, right, till they become 13 and uh, reach puberty, meaning uh, the, the way it's described in the, the Gemara is what we call sa'arot, two pubic hairs, basically. Uh, if the child, uh, if the, the boy uh, has reached puberty, they're considered an adult, or maybe till the age where the son uh, understands what a vow is. Uh, and that's earlier. The Gemara says that's between ages 12 and 13, meaning into the 13th year, but not you know, meaning a year earlier. Um, and again, as we said, uh, either this is the tradition, or it's an educational tool. And again, the Gemara says, right, till when does the father have an obligation to teach his child? Till 12, till 13. Uh, and that is the discussion. And the, 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 the daf today uh, ends with a story of Rabbi Hanina, who uh, is a minor at this point, or, well, we'll see. Um, he's somewhere between 12 and 13. Uh, no, he's actually 13. And his father um, makes him a Nazir. And then Rabban Gamliel wanted to, like, check him to see if he had hit puberty already. And, um, and uh, or to see, uh, right, to either see if he hit puberty or to check him, to ask him if he understands uh, what it means to take on a vow. Uh, and then Rabbi Hanina got up, again, this is like a 13-year-old boy. He gets up and he says, Rabban Gamliel, you don't have to check me. He says, if I'm a minor, so then I'll be a Nazir for my father. And if I'm an adult, so I'll take it upon myself, meaning I'm fine with being a Nazir, right? I'll, I'll just be a Nazir either way. Uh, and the story ends with Rabban Gamliel kissing him on the head, and he says to him, this child is going to be a great halachic leader of Israel very soon. And the, the daf ends today by saying, and that was actually the case, right? Very soon afterwards, uh, Rabbi Hanina became a very, uh, a very wise scholar. Uh, so I thought it was just a beautiful um, uh, a story uh, to really think about um, what does it mean uh, to make your son, first of all, a Nazir? Uh, what was his father trying to teach him? And it sounds like he really got the message uh, because he really becomes a, a leading scholar uh, when he grew up. So with that, we finish Daf 29. Uh, I want to wish everybody a Chodesh Tov. Uh, today is Rosh Chodesh Adar, which means in two weeks, is Purim. We have to figure out in two weeks when we're going to have class. Uh, I'll get back to you on that. Um, but Be'ezrat Hashem, just wishing everybody, right, we say, uh, So just wishing everybody a lot of simcha, of joy this month. It should be a joyous month. Uh, and wishing everybody a wonderful week. See you next week. Uh, and again, um, those of you who missed the beginning, anybody who would like to, we're going to have a Daf Yomi meetup 
next Friday, next Friday morning in Jerusalem. Uh, so anybody who would like to uh, uh, meet in person, you're all invited. And uh, we can, uh, I'll send out details on the email next week. So wishing everyone a wonderful week. Rabbi, I won't be there. I'll be in the air. So can you do it before?